He's gone by many names. The Long Island serial killer, the Gilgo Beach murderer, and now authorities say they've identified him by his true name and taken him into custody. We're unraveling the mystery that dates back more than 10 years. Lawn Crime Daily, covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everybody to Long Crime Daily. I'm Jesse Weber. A major update to a true crime mystery that has haunted the Long Island, New York area for more than a decade. Authorities say that they have arrested a man believed to be the Gilgo Beach serial killer. Law enforcement took Rex Hewerman into custody late Thursday and his home was being searched on Friday. He's lived for decades across the bay from where multiple sets of human remains were found. He's now charged with first and second degree murder in connection with the deaths of three women and he's considered a prime suspect in a fourth. Suffolk County prosecutors are asking for Hewerman to be held without bail because of the nature of the crimes as well as very unsettling internet searches that included child pornography. Hewerman is a married father of two and a licensed architect in Manhattan. Authorities say they first identified him as a suspect in March of last year, and the task force took over from there. Our, po our partners and uh, my office, we used the grand jury to continue to investigate, and we executed over 300 subpoenas, search warrants pertaining to this individual to find out more information. Uh, one of the things that we did is we followed him because we wanted to get an abandonment sample of his DNA. Uh, which we were able to do. Uh, we also got uh, DNA samples, abandonment samples from his family. Uh, this really um, um, supported our decision to keep our investigative um, focus secret because we knew that this one person would be watching and we didn't want to give him uh, any insight into what we were doing. And we also didn't want him to know just how close we were getting. Uh, so we maintain the, the, the grand jury secrecy and we maintain the integrity of our investigation. Uh, in addition to those, those uh, um, uh, Gilgo searches, he was searching, compulsively searching pictures of the victims, but not only pictures of the victims, pictures of their, uh, their uh, relatives, their, their, their sisters, uh, their children. Uh, and he was trying to locate those individuals. All right, we want to give you some background on this case, which has thus far remained unsolved. So an escort named Shannon Gilbert disappeared in 2010 while leaving a client's home. And as police searched for her, they found a body, then another, and then another. In all, 11 sets of human remains were found along a highway near Gilgo Beach in 2010 and 2011, including Gilbert's. Now, most of the victims were female sex workers, but an Asian man's body was also found, as well as that of a toddler. Detectives believe it's unlikely that all the bodies found near Gilgo Beach were connected to just one killer. You may have seen a documentary on this case called Lost Girls, released on Netflix in 2020. In 2022, Suffolk County's police commissioner created a task force that included the DA, the Sheriff's Office, New York State Police, and the FBI to renew the search for new clues and hopefully push the investigation forward. Criminal profilers at the time the bodies were discovered said killers like this do tend to fit a certain type. I mean, just statistically, he's likely to be a male between the ages of 20 and 35. With a serial killer like this, the thrill is in the kill, so that what really drives him is not sex, but rather the power over another human being. It's the power of God, and he feels mighty strong at this point because apparently he's killed many people and has not yet been caught. Unbelievable. Okay, I'm here with my co-hosts, Brian Buckmeyer, Terry Austin. Brian, I'll start with you. How have they connected him? Because this is like a major update. I remember following this case back in law school 10 years ago. Yeah, it's DNA and cell phone records. Now, supposedly he had a number of burner phones that were communicating with a number of these women in close proximity to when uh, they died. And all of a sudden, when, they, when their bodies are believed to be deceased, no more communication. He seems to be one of the last ones to speak with them. Also, there are Harris fragments from his wife uh, on, on all three of the bodies, and on Waterman, one of the victims, his hair fra fractures are found in it. Now, interestingly enough, they're not saying that it's exactly uh, their hair. They're saying 99.96 of the community can be excluded from these hairs, mm -hmm. but not his wife and not himself. So they're thinking he must have had some co sort of connection, and maybe his wife's hair was on him and then dropped off on their bodies. In other words, it sure looks like it's his material or his exactly. wife's material. 
The question is, though, now, Terry, he might be connected to at least these three deaths, but what about all of the remains, all of those bodies that I mentioned? How well, do they connect them to those? Yeah, you're right. There are 11 bodies that were found in this area, and I think that fourth victim, they said they have very similar information about her. I think they will ultimately include her in the charges. I think the others are going to be more difficult. So, for instance, they found a male, and they found a toddler, and they found who they think is the mother of the toddler. I think right. it's going to be more difficult to connect those bodies to this. But they don't want to add an extra case, because if it's weak on that case, it'll weaken the rest of them, right? Exactly. The murder one that he's being charged with is for killing two or more people. So, right. as a defense attorney, I'm looking it right about off the bat which one of these cases can I pull apart at least maybe beat the murder one maybe try to go down on murder two maybe he says he's extremely emotionally distressed hey even the investigators say that they're not connecting all these murders to one one person so use that if I'm a defense attorney to my advantage and Terry real quick they're gonna search his house so they might find more evidence they will find more evidence he's done all these searches that we've talked about and they could find evidence as far as the other women are concerned what a development. I'm very curious to see this. I know his defense attorneys have just been handed the case, but maybe they have room to argue certain things like fight against the DNA and the cell phone evidence. We'll continue to follow it. Still ahead on Long Crime Daily, a judge had an affair with a prosecutor, and now a murder conviction is being thrown out because of it. But first, another day wraps up in the Bradley Yon trial as the defendant tries to navigate being his own lawyer and questioning members of the victim's family. A few of Friday's most outrageous moments are next. And welcome back, everybody. The Illinois defendant who chose to rep represent himself against multiple charges is presenting his case to the court and calling witnesses. And let's just say things are not exactly going smoothly. Here's a little bit of background for you. In November 2021, Bradley Yan and his accomplice Karen Blackledge allegedly carjacked, sexually assaulted, and robbed the home of 77-year-old Tina Schmidt. She died a month later. And while authority prosecutors aren't pursuing murder charges, they believe that Schmidt did succumb to the trauma that she endured. Jan is currently facing multiple charges of home invasion, aggravated kidnapping, vehicular hijacking, burglary, and sexual assault. His accomplice, Blackledge, pleaded guilty to home invasion and sexual assault and is now serving 40 years in prison. Jan, on the other hand, chose to act as his own defense counsel as he faces a possible life sentence. On Friday, he questioned several of the alleged victim's family members, including her husband and daughter. Here are just some of the blockbuster moments from court on Friday. Mr. Schmidt, uh, just to refresh your memory, uh you stated you were subpoenaed for phone records, correct? Objection, Your Honor. We just dealt with this. Mr. Yon, the court sustained that objection. Your Honor. So we need to go down a new path. I'm just letting the witness know where we're at, Your Honor. He and was here. He knows. So next question, sir. Um, okay. And you did provide those records. Objection, Your Honor. Asked and answered, and we've gone down this path. Mr. Schmidt, uh, objection. are you aware, let me, are you aware that there was no nine Objection, one call? Your Honor. I will sustain the objection, Mr. There was no nine one call. Objection, Your Honor. I'll ask the bailiff to have the jury return to the jury room. I'd like you to describe for us your mother's pain in the last month of her life uh, before she passed away in December. Was, was she in pain? Yes, she was in extreme pain. I'm sorry, could She you was hear? in extreme pain. Objection, Your Honor, testimonial. That's what witnesses do, Mr. Young, so. Testimonial objection. hearsay, Your Honor. Again, objection is overruled. Young, your next witness, who will that be? That would be Kevin Douglas. Your Honor. All right. Douglas is not here, Your Honor, and is not available today. All right. Is he subpoenaed, Mr. Young? He is. He's on the. Has list. he been subpoenaed? Yes, I believe he has. By our office, Your Honor, he did not receive a defense subpoena, and there's uh, he's not available today. All right. So you have not served him with a defense subpoena, is that correct? No, Your Honor, I have not. All right, so he is not going to be available, apparently. Do you have another witness, then? Give me one moment, Judge. Uh...
So he's representing himself. He's calling some witnesses. From that, it doesn't look so good, but you give him this more of a granular picture. How's he doing so far? Well, usually the statement when you say he who calls himself as a as his own attorney has a fool for a client. That's, that's a slogan, right? Yeah, it's okay, something like that. that. In any event, he actually did not do that poorly. He called on his direct case some of the same witnesses that the prosecution called, and he asked the same questions, so that was a waste of time. But he called the husband, and at first you might think, okay, why are you putting this man through so much torture? And I'm certain that the jury was thinking the same thing. But he established a couple points. He said, did you really call 911? He said, basically, was there blood on the couch when they moved her? He asked whether or not she died. He asked, where were you? Did you come home at what time? So he's trying to implicate that it was the husband. Now, of course, I think the jury knows that's not the case. But I do think he was trying to point this finger mm -hmm. to someone else. OK. A for effort. Um, you're laughing, Brian, because I, I have to tell you, I've seen a number of courtroom moments. I don't think I've ever heard a prosecutor yell that loudly and yell objection. Yeah, uh, in my law school, unfortunately, we didn't get grades for effort, only for doing well or not doing That's well. True. That's good. So, and I'm going to grade him the, the same way. Um, he doesn't know what he's doing. And a lot of this, he's splitting hairs. Yep. He, he's splitting hairs and just getting argumentative and kind of going down this rabbit hole with the witness. And I don't know why the prosecutor's getting so hot on the collar. It's not like he's making an intentional mistake. He's not like he's trying to get one over on the prosecutor. He just doesn't know what he's doing. Make the objection. Don't lose your cool. I get that you're frustrated because of who you have to go up against, but... He's not winning any battles. But at the end of the day, he doesn't want the jury to hear something. And it, whether it's his mistake or bad, you know, he doesn't want the jury you to hear. You don't got to look like that while doing it, though. You can object a different way. You think the jury's taking note of this? Oh, definitely taking note. And I understand why the prosecution got upset, because the judge specifically said, not there, but at another time, you can't ask about those records because they're not in evidence. This witness cannot lay the foundation. Don't ask about that. And he did anyway. So I think the prosecution, at least at that point, got very upset because I definitely think the defendant was trying to either get a mistrial or intentionally ignoring the judge. See, I, I think a part of it is angry as they're getting. Underneath, they're like, this is great. Yeah. We're doing great. I mean, this is, this is a slam dunk for us when a defendant represents himself, unless, of course, they're a lawyer or... I think we talked about maybe there was one case where a defendant represented himself and actually was acquitted, but one. Bench trials usually. Yeah, bench trials with the judge. All right, coming up on Long Crime Daily, a doctor took people behind the scenes to show them surgeries live on social media, but those live streams have now gotten her into some serious trouble. Plus, a convicted murderer has that conviction tossed after courthouse misconduct. We have details on the inappropriate relationship that sent the case to the Court of Appeals. And welcome back to Long Crime Daily, everybody. An Oklahoma appeals court threw out a man's first degree murder conviction because the judge and the prosecutor in the case were having an affair. So in a narrow three to two decision, the criminal court of appeals ruled that Robert Hashhagen III will get a new trial. He was sentenced to life in prison after his murder conviction in 2021. New evidence came to light revealing that Judge Timothy Henderson had a sexual relationship with a woman in the district attorney's office who participated in the trial. Henderson resigned in March of 2021 after three female attorneys came forward making allegations of sexual misconduct. He described the contact as consensual and no charges were ever filed. Henderson has previously said that his rulings were always fair and supported by the evidence. Hashagen has, was accused of killing his 94-year-old neighbor in 2013. No word yet on whether any of the former judges' other cases could be impacted. So, Brian, only three of the five appeals judges actually voted to do this. Why? My guess and what I'm, what I'm getting from the answer is that some of the judges are saying this thing called harmless error. And they're looking at it and say, okay, I get it. His due process was violated, and that's what the three judges said. You're supposed to have a fair and impartial judge to weigh the evidence against you. And clearly that can't be if a prosecutor is sleeping with a judge. But they also evaluate the evidence against him, and they're probably saying the two even if this was an unfair judge, they still would have got to the same result. So why are we overturning a murder conviction? Obviously, three of them disagreed, and that's why we're here. It was close. You think they made the right decision? And also, I imagine they're going to look at the past cases now, and maybe other things could get overturned, no? Uh, they definitely made the right decision. I think it's a conflict no matter what, whether or not it's harmless error. I understand you don't want to have to turn over all of these cases, but there is definitely a conflict if the judge is sleeping with a prosecutor. Somehow, subliminally, that is going to affect the case. So I think it should have been unanimous. I think the Court of Appeals should have just unanimously decided, look, this is not right, and 
put that conviction aside, they're definitely going to look at other cases and go back and try to determine whether or not there were other cases where he was with people or other cases where he made the wrong decision because he has a conflict of interest. Well, does it matter if he ruled favorably for the attorney or not? Yes, because at the end of the day, the you cannot justify the ends with the means. You cannot say we got the right person even if the system didn't work. It's a criminal justice system. It's supposed to be better than any one individual person. So if it is, if it is flawed because an individual within it is flawed and the process is flawed, even if we get it right, it must be overturned. It's the same reason why we reverse cases in suppression. If yeah. there's a legally search, we don't say, well, the cocaine was in his truck, even though the cop busted him over the head and searched. We just don't do that. And real quick, Terry, he could have had a relationship with her, but he would have had to disclose it and recuse himself, right? Well, I think he should have had the relationship subsequent to the case, not during mm. the trial. Because during the trial, I think it's a problem, no matter what. The way you made those arguments, you, you, you won me over, you know? <laughs> it was yeah. The way you argued that motion. All right, when we come back, a plastic surgeon who put videos of her surgeries all over social media, guess what? Can't practice medicine anymore. The information that's now coming to light about Dr. Roxy and the attention she was paying to her fans instead of her patients. A plastic surgeon who featured her surgeries and videos on social media has now had her medical license revoked. The Ohio Medical Board voted on Wednesday for a permanent revocation of the medical license of Dr. Catherine Growey. She's known online as Dr. Roxy. Now, according to records, the surgeon has been reprimanded several times for live streaming pa patient surgeries. The medical board decided she showed more care for her videos than she did for her patients. The board also found that she live streamed videos without patient consent, violating their privacy. Several patients ended up having to get treatment elsewhere to fix complications that they ended up having. One of them filed a complaint in November about her post-operation injuries that meant she had to get a bunch of other surgeries. And that's when Growey first had her medical license suspended. Then this week, the board took it away. Growey told the board that she had learned from her mistakes and said that the process has humbled her. She promised never to live stream another surgery again, but the medical board deemed she won't have a chance to, at least in Ohio, because she can't practice medicine anymore. So Terry, other physicians have recorded surgeries before they never got in trouble. What's the difference? There's a huge difference here. First of all, other physicians have gotten permission to do those recordings. And generally speaking, they're doing it not for social media, not for fame, but for educational purposes. And so here, she's not trying to educate anyone. She is just trying to promote herself on social media. And without the consent of the patients, which is even I think more troubling so I think it was the right decision here not to just suspend her license but to also revoke her license not to give her any more chances frankly unless she goes to another state because Ohio can only control what is going on in Ohio and it's just the idea that she was focusing more on the videos the fame and attention of it it makes me wonder if other people are gonna get in trouble because my understanding is she was warned for years to stop doing this yeah, she was, but it kept becoming warning and warning. It only seemed to become an issue because one, consent, privacy issues, huge. Gotta get the consent. And two, it seemed like she was sloppy while she was streaming, which led me to the question of, so are you telling me if she got consent and set up a whole film crew and she just did better, that maybe we'll have this be allowed? I thought they would just come out and say, maybe we shouldn't be doing these things on TikTok. Yeah. I would have expected a firmer band. Well, it, it, it just makes me from like a law point of view, like having a conversation with your client and being like, oh, the client consents to this conversation. It's like, do you really want to have this conversation live stream so you could show how the law practice works? Well, I think now with social media, everything is getting extended. So I think the courts and the agencies that are licensing these people are looking at it and saying, look, if there's a legitimate value to it, if it can help anyone else, if there's an educational value, and of course, if you have that consent, they're not gonna ban it wholeheartedly. They're gonna at least try to allow some of these people to film, whether it's medical, whether it's you know educational yeah. or legal, I think they're gonna try to expand it. And her legal liability after doing all this? Privacy violations, 
intentional infliction of emotional distress. Terry's Terry, favorite, as we, Terry's as we all know. favorite. Uh, I mean, all of these can be can be issues that they put up. And of course, we're, like you heard, some have to go to other places to get those treatments fixed. So you can sue for what well, you had to pay to get it fixed as well. There's a laundry list of things that people can come forward and charge them with. You know what shocks me? It's terrible judgment. And to have somebody who you're basically putting your life in their hands, this is like, how did you even get to that place of, of getting your medical license, doing this, becoming a doctor? That's the part that's just a little alarming when you think about it. Brian, Terry, great to see you both. Thank you so much, as always. And everyone out there, thanks for joining us here on Long Crime Daily. We're going to see you next time as we discuss justice in America.